how two-factor authentication works and why you should use it to keep the hackers out. Hi everyone, Leo Notenboom here for AskLeo.com where we've been trying to keep hackers out since 2003 answering your questions. Hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure and hit that subscribe button down below. Uh, that will get you every video as they're released throughout the week. And at the end of the video, if you would hit that thumbs up button, if you found it helpful, useful, interesting, both of those things actually help more people find the answers they're looking for as they search on the world's number two search engine, YouTube. So two-factor authentication is something that we talk about a lot. Security professionals, especially in the last couple of years, have taken to recommending it frequently and strongly. The question, of course, is, well, just what the heck is it and how does it help me stay safe? So to begin with, we have to talk about what it means to authenticate. When you're logging in, you're doing something that's called authenticating. You are proving that you are the person, the authentic person who set up the account or who should have access to the resources or whatever. You have to prove essentially that you are you. Now, in the past, we've done that with something you know. In other words, your password. It was enough to simply know your login account ID, be it your email address or something else, and a password. It was something you could remember. And then, of course, we got so many passwords, we had to have tools to help us remember. But the bottom line is that simply knowing the password, being able to provide the password when requested, was enough to confirm that you were who you said you were until your passwords were stolen or your account compromised somehow. Then it wasn't enough anymore. Hackers could take your password and log in as you and basically change your password and steal your account. What we ended up adding to the mix was something you have. So in addition to something you know, we add something you have. At login time, you need to prove that you are in possession of a specific thing. Now that thing is quite often a smartphone, but not necessarily. That thing can be your access to another email account. It can be an app on a phone or some other device. It can be your ability to respond to a voice message sent to your phone number. All of those things prove that you have that phone or that device in your possession and coupled with knowing your password, those two things together then prove you are you. Now, I do have to talk about another type of authentication, and that is who you are. When we talk about biometrics, in reality, that's another form. It's another factor that can be used come authentication time. Things like fingerprints or iris scans or facial recognition. Those are all things that are unique to every individual and can be used as an additional factor when it comes to multi-factor authentication. And you'll notice I just said multi-factor, not just two-factor. Here's the problem. Right now, most biometrics, most fingerprints, most facial recognition is actually used as a single factor. Your phone unlocks because it recognizes your face. Your computer logs you in because it recognizes your fingerprint. That's only one factor. If this were truly two-factor, we would be combining that with something else. You would have to know your password and provide your fingerprint. And in fact, it's certainly possible to go all in on three-factor authentication and require both something you know, your password, something you have, your device, and something you are, your fingerprint or your face. And it's not until you provide all three of those that you're actually allowed access to the account. Now, of course, that's not very common, but I'm sure you can understand that for incredibly high security related accounts, that could be the type of multi-factor authentication that could be put in place to ensure that the account remains secure. So how does it all work? How do you prove you have your phone? Well, 
there are a couple of ways. The one that most people recommend, and the one that I use myself, uses an app on your phone, your smartphone. So what we're talking about right now really is app-based. It's an app that would run on your smartphone or potentially your tablet. And in fact, in some cases, potentially even your PC. But the bottom line is it's an app that when you set up two-factor authentication, you associate the app with your account, usually through scanning a QR code or entering in some other kind of magical code. What this does is it sets up a form of encryption that causes a six digit number to be displayed on your phone that changes every 30 seconds. What that number is, is unpredictable. It looks completely random. There is no way to predict what the number will be, even given the current number or even given the sequence of numbers. There's no way to know what the next number will be, except if you were part of the process of setting up this association. If you exchanged the appropriate keys when you set up two-factor authentication. So what happens then is that only your phone can display the number that only your account wants to expect. So at login time, you provide your account ID, you provide your password, and then you are asked to provide the six digit number that is currently displayed on your device. You know what the number is because it's displayed on your device. Your account knows what number to expect because you set this up with that account. Nobody else can predict what that number will be, so there's no way to fake it. That means is that your ability to provide that current six digit number correctly proves you are in possession of that device. It's a second factor. The number is constantly changing. And in fact, if you have multiple accounts that all use this kind of security, this kind of two-factor authentication, you'll have different numbers for each account. You can see in the image of a Google Authenticator scenario here that each account that I've got associated with it is displaying a different number. All of those numbers change every 30 seconds. So again, this is something you know, your account and password, and something you have, you've proven that you have your phone in your possession. Now, SMS is another popular approach to two-factor authentication, and essentially it proves the same kind of thing. When you log in, you provide your account and password, the something you know, and the service sends you a text message with a code. Usually it's a four or six digit number or potentially an alphanumeric string that you then have to type in to prove that you got it. In other words, you're proving you have the phone in your possession. Now, there is a lot of, I'll just say FUD around a concern that SMS can be hacked. Absolutely, there are ways to hack SMS. You can do what's called SIM swapping to basically take over your phone. Here's the thing, even with that risk, using SMS for your two-factor authentication is still better than not having two-factor authentication at all. So if SMS-based two-factor authentication is the only thing available to you because that's what you have, you don't have a smartphone or that's the only one provided by your provider, use it, absolutely use it. If they have both SMS and Google Authenticator's two-factor, and you can handle using two-factor with Google Authenticator, by all means, do that instead. It'll make you feel more secure and it will work no matter where you are. Because remember, SMS two-factor authentication requires you be able to receive an SMS message. If you are traveling, say overseas, that may not be the case. Question number one I get from people after I've described all of this about two-factor authentication is, you mean I have to do that every time? No, no you don't. The way you make two-factor authentication less annoying is you use it to establish a level of trust on a machine. What that means is, 
The first time you sign into a machine, you need to provide your second factor. So you would log in with your ID, your password, and whatever two-factor authentication mechanism you have enabled for that account. There will be an option to say, don't require two-factor again on this machine forever or for 30 days or something like that. What that means is that the next time you sign in to that specific machine, you won't need your second factor. You could just log in with what you know. Now, I say that specific machine, it's actually even more specific than that. It's that specific browser on that specific machine because the information about, yep, he logged in once successfully, is saved in a cookie. And cookies, of course, are separate between the different browsers. So if you log in using Edge and then you log in using Chrome, you'll need to provide your second factor each time. But as long as you don't delete cookies, once you've said, I don't need a second factor for this login on this machine, you're fine. You're good. You won't have to do it again. Now, this protects you. This sounds kind of like it's opening up a door, but it's not. Realize that what you're protecting yourself against is someone who doesn't have access to your machine from logging in as you, even if they know your password. Well, they'll be doing it on a different machine. It'll be a first time login for them, which means that they will be required to prove they have the second factor and they don't. So they won't be able to log in. It's only after you have once successfully signed in using two-factor authentication that this option of not requiring it on that specific machine and that specific browser is even available. So it protects you and it's not annoying at all. Question number two that I get from people whenever I talk about two-factor authentication. What happens if I lose my phone or my second factor, whatever that might be? When you set up two-factor authentication with a provider, at the same time, you will typically be given one of several different recovery options. They will either insist you have a recovery email in place, so that in a sense becomes your second factor. They will give you a set of one-time use codes that you then save somewhere secure, like in an encrypted file or printed in your safe. Those one-time codes can be used in place of your second factor. That's why they need to be kept safe because they can each be used exactly once, but they will prove that you are the person who set up this account and got those codes in the first place. So here's what happens when you lose your phone, I'll say. You sign in normally. Now, if you're on a machine where you've already remembered and you don't need your second factor, great, you just sign in. If you do need your second factor, you would use whatever recovery mechanism has been set up for that account, be it an alternate email address or a one-time recovery code or whatever. Those kinds of recovery processes, those kinds of things are the things that will allow you to log into your account. Then, the first thing you do when you log into your account successfully is you turn off two-factor authentication. It sounds backwards, but you really do. You turn off two-factor authentications so that you can then turn around and enable it again. Because when you enable it again, you will then reset the two-factor authentication and associate it with your new phone or your new smartphone or your new whatever whatever it is you've replaced your device with and you carry on. And of course, if you're using SMS two-factor authentication, nine times out of 10, you don't even have to do this. All you end up doing is you go to your provider, you get a new phone, you have them port your old number to your replacement phone and life goes on. SMS two-factor authentication is sent to the number, not the device. So that if the number, if you get a new phone, you start getting your text messages on the new phone instead, and you're good to go. And of course, third question that I hear, what if my provider doesn't support it? Or how do I know if they do? So more and more providers do indeed support two-factor authentication. And personally, 
I have enabled two-factor authentication on every account I have that provides it, that supports it. And wherever I can, I end up using the Google Authenticator app or a compatible Authy app, which allows me to have multiple accounts in a single app and actually have that app installed on more than one device. The bottom line here, though, is that two-factor really is a critical piece of your overall security plan these days. Passwords, as good as they are, they're really not enough, certainly not for anything super important. So I strongly suggest that you seriously consider enabling two-factor authentication on every account you have that provides it, making sure to set up recovery codes or whatever fallback mechanism they provide should you lose your second factor, but do it that way. Even if the hackers somehow discover your actual password, they still can't log in. For the original article on which this video is based, for updates, for related links, for comments, and much more, visit askleo.com slash 16401. I'm Leo Notenboom. This is askleo.com. Thanks for watching.